Welcome viewers to this broadcast of God's Word. Uh, today's message is titled, Beware of the Fatal Snare. Beware of the Fatal Snare. And the portion of scripture that is going to guide us is 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. And this is what the Word of God says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. Do not love the world, or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Father, we thank you, Lord the Almighty, for the reading of your word. Even as we delve into your word, we pray that you guide us by your Holy Spirit. Open our minds to understand your word. Soften our hearts to respond to your word. Transform our will to obey. And apply your word, O King, Lord of all glory. Father, Lord, we thank you, we glorify, and we bless you. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and believe. Amen. So this portion of scripture is telling us about the world. Many are injured, others never seize the chance to escape, but succumb and lose their lives. Relatives and friends cry and moan, who will stop the wanton destruction to human life? God will not. Why? God has given mankind free will. He has given mankind freedom of choice. You can choose to obey God's word and live. You can also choose to disregard God and his word and destroy your life. God is theocratic. He is the source of life and has given his word on how the life he has given should be lived. A life governed by the word of God is a life well lived and taps into God's blessings. When John is writing to the church, to believers, warning them not to love the world and everything in the world. And then he goes ahead to tell us about what is in the world. He tells us that in the world there is the lust of the flesh, there is the lust of the eyes, and there is the pride of life. And he tells us that these are not from God but they are from the world. And he tells us that the world and the last there, and he tells us that those who love the world and the things in the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Then he goes ahead to tell us that the world and the last thereof is passing away. But those who do the will of God lives forever. God created us in his image as the word of God tells us in Genesis chapter 1 verse 16, so that he could have a relationship with us. Our first affection was to God who created us and placed us in this physical world to tend it. As the word of God tells us in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, God commanded the first man, Adam in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 to 17, to eat from any tree in the garden, but must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when he eats from it, he shall certainly die. But then we see up to this point, everything was well, everything was fine. God has created man. He has placed man in the garden of Eden, which had everything, because God wanted man to be comfortable. Because God, of all the things that God created, it is only man he created in his image. And he created man in his image so that he can have a relationship with man. So that he can, he can relate with man. He can speak to man. Man can speak to him. Just the way people in a relationship speak to each other. That is how God wanted to relate with us. And as he has told us in, your, in his word in Isaiah 43 verse 7, that he created us for his own glory. So therefore, everything was fine. 
until the problem entered. Adam and his wife, Eve, did not obey God's command. The command that God had given them in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, to eat from every tree in the garden, but not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They did not obey that command. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, Satan, who is a fallen angel, an enemy of God, influenced them to disobey God. Satan enticed them to eat from the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they ate from it. And having eaten from the forbidden tree, there was consequences to that. Because God had told them that in the day you shall eat of that tree, you shall surely die. The spiritual effect of their sin of disobedience to God is that they died spiritually to God. And this happened instantly. That they died spiritually to God instantly. Their affection for God disappeared, left them immediately. Because sin entered and God is holy. Sin separates us from God. And so they were separated from God. And spiritual death means that our affection for God was lost as sin entered between us and holy God. Because we as descendants of Adam are spiritually dead to God, we give birth to children who are spiritually dead to God. Instead of leaning towards good, as we grow up and reach the age that we can discern good and evil, we naturally lean towards evil. That is what happened to Adam and Eve. That after they disobeyed God, their affection for God left them. And when they had God walking in the cool of the day, they hid from him. Why did they hide from God? It is because now sin entered and God is holy. And therefore they had to hide, not only from God, but also from themselves. Because sin is shameful. And they, hide, they, they had to hide, not only from God, but from each other. And since now sin has entered and has separated man from God, then that is a problem. The sin problem is what Jesus Christ was born into this world to pay for by his blood shed on the cross. God made the first promise of the coming Messiah or Savior in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. That is immediately after the fall of man, after the sin of disobedience to God, God made this promise in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, which is the first revelation of what God would do to purge sin, to deal with the sin of disobedience that has entered the world. So, the blood of Jesus takes effect and pays for the sin of every individual who would believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of their life and personal Savior. As the Word of God tells us in John chapter 1 verse 12, that to those who believed him, to those who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So sin having entered the world, death also entered through sin and there is no way God could have just let man be with sin and separated from him. So God made a provision to pay for the sins of mankind. And as the word of God tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22, there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And the blood of the sinner could not pay for his sins. Neither could the blood of the animals pay for his sins. Therefore, God made a provision that it will be Jesus who would come and shed his blood on the cross to pay for the sins of man, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So that whoever believes in Jesus, their sins will be paid for by his blood on the cross. 
so that they are reconciled back to God. The sin that separates them from God is paid for, is taken away because they have believed and received God's provision for their sins, for God's provision for the sin that entered humanity through Adam is Jesus Christ. He is the sacrifice that God has given for the sins of mankind, which is to be received individually by each person by faith. One has to believe and receive Jesus in order for that sacrifice that God has given to take effect upon them so that they are now reconciled back to God individually. So when John was writing 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 to 17 which is our lead scripture he was writing to the people who have believed and received Christ. He was writing to the church. He was writing to born again Christians and this message is both a warning and a counsel. This is how he begins. Do not love the world or anything in the world. What is he talking about? The world in this context is a sinful lifestyle of unsaved person. The corrupt value system of this world. And when we talk about this world, we are not talking about the trees, we are not talking about uh, the buildings and the mountains. We are talking about man. So, man became corrupted by the sin. And instead of thinking about the things of God, man now became rebellious to God. And when John is writing this, he's telling us who have been reconciled back to God by faith in Christ Jesus, that we should not continue in our former ways of the world, of the unsaved people. The former ways of thinking and acting contrary to the word of God, because now we've been reconciled back to God. And now the Holy Spirit lives in us, we know God, and therefore He's writing to us to tell us that we should live by the word of God. So, here, saved people have a new righteous nature, as the word of God tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. And their minds are to be governed by the spirit or word of God, as the word of God tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25. Therefore, the lifestyle of a saved person is one that is aligned to the word of God. If you are born again and your life is not aligned to the word of God, then beware that you have been ensnared by the enemy of God, Satan. It is not so for the unsaved people. Unsaved people have a sin nature. And their minds are governed by the desires of their bodies. Therefore, the lifestyle of an unsaved person is aligned to desires of the body. But a born-again Christian, their mind is expected to be governed by the word of God, not by the desires of the flesh. In fact, we are to beat up our flesh to conform to our new nature in Christ Jesus. Because in our spirit we are born again to God. We were created alive to God. But when we, our, our first, our, our forefather, Adam and Eve sinned, we spiritually died to God. And when we believe and receive Jesus, our spirit is born again to God, becomes alive again to God. That's why we become born again. That's why the word again comes in, again into our former state before the fall of man, before Adam and Eve sinned. So we become justified. We become accepted before God because our sins have been taken away 
by the blood of Jesus. So, therefore, we are different from those that are not born again. Their lifestyle is governed, as we shall see here, what John has said, that if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. And a person living a sinful lifestyle of unsaved person cannot claim to love God. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 18 to 20, Jesus said that we shall know them by their fruits. A person's actions are a better indication of who they really are. So that is what John has given to us. He has given us a, a, a warning that do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. That is the warning that John has given us. And then he has gone ahead to give us the counsel. And what is the counsel? For everything in the world, the, then he goes ahead to tell us what is in the world. That is what is in the lifestyle of unsaved person. What is in the, what, what is, what is in the life? What is the value system of a person who is not born again? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So there, John has told us that in the belief system, in the value system, the lifestyle of unsaved person, what governs them, or what they value, and what they yield to, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he has told us that this is not from the Father, but this is from the corrupt value system of the unsaved person's life. All that is in the lifestyle of unsaved person is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is the snare Satan uses to execute his deadly mission on mankind. And Jesus gave us the mission that Satan is on. And he told us in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the enemy Satan came but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. So Satan uses this snare of the lust of the flesh, of the lust of the eyes, and of the pride of life to ensnare man so that he's able to execute his deadly mission of killing man. God wants us well. He desires that we may live in accordance to his counsel so that we may live forever with him. But Satan, who is an enemy of God and who opposes God, he has a plan also for us, but his plan is to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. And what does he use? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is the snare Satan uses to execute his deadly mission on mankind. And he used this snare on Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. And they fell into his temptation, and sin entered the world, and death through sin, as the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. So, sin entered the world through the way of disobedience to God's word. And then death came into the world through sin. So we see Satan, these are the, two, the three tricks that Satan uses in his snare. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we see him using the same 
on Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. And this is what happened in verse 6. And when, that is verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, when the woman, Eve, saw that the tree was good for food, that is, that is the last of the flesh. She saw that it was good for food, the last of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the last of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof, and did it, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did it. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So, the same trap that Satan uses on us, the same snare, is the same snare he used on Adam and Eve in the garden. The last of the eyes, the last of the flesh, are the pride of life. And this is the snare John is writing to warn us against in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. The snare that we should not love the world, not the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For all that is in the world, that is all that is in the lifestyle of unsaved person, all that is in the value system of this corrupt mind of man is the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he goes ahead to tell us this is not from the Father, but it is from the mind of the unsaved person. For the mind of the unsaved person is corrupted by the Adamic sin we are all born with as descendants of Adam. So here John is telling us that this is passing away. This corrupt world system, this corrupt way of thinking of sinful man is passing away. But those who obey God, those who live by his word, lives forever. They walk with God in this life and they will eternally live with him after this life. So. Today, Satan continues ensnaring people with the same snare of temptation of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life in form of sexual indulgence resulting in AIDS, alcohol, and drug addiction, and covetousness, and violence. So this is the content. This is what is in that snare in that snare of the last of the flesh, in that snare of the last of the eyes, in that snare of the pride of life, this is what is in it. And this is what Satan is using today. Homesteads are dotted with graves of people whose lives were cut short by this snare. And it affects all families across the board, including my own family. I lost my elder brother in 1998. And I lost him to the same snare of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I lost him through alcohol-related complication. He developed cirrhosis of the liver, and he died at the age of 30. Because this snare that Satan uses, when you get into it, you get there in very subtle ways, in very small ways. And before long, you are hooked up to it. It's a snare that Satan has put. He puts the desire for you to disobey God in you, in your mind. Then, when you don't use the word of God to bind that thought, then that thought you delve into it 
and you act on it. And that is a snare that Satan continues pulling. And as he pulls, the noose tightens around the neck of the person who, are, who has been ensnared. And Satan continues pulling that snare as the noose tightens until now that person succumbs and they die. That is what Satan is using today. So I lost my brother in 1998. He was only 30 years old. And two years ago, I lost my younger brother to the same snare. My younger brother also was hooked up to alcohol and he died of alcohol related complications and he died at the age of 33 so and this is in my family these are my siblings there are so many families who have lost their loved ones through this snare and that is why john is warning the church the believers because you are not immune to falling into temptation but you are empowered to say no to Satan and stand firm and stand true to God, live by his word. Whereas the unsaved person does not have this power that we've been given, the power to bind Satan, the power to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God we've been given. Jesus says, for to us it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything comes in parables. That hearing they may hear and not understand. That seeing they may see and not comprehend. But for, to us, we have the word of God. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. We are supposed to meditate on God's word. We are supposed to apply God's word. When Satan brings those sinful thoughts to us, we are not supposed to delve into those thoughts. We are not supposed to act on those thoughts. We are supposed to bind them by the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. We cannot wish Satan away, but we can fight him through the word of God. Jesus fought him through the word of God. He would tell him it is written when he followed Jesus in the wilderness. When Jesus went into the wilderness, to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. And in the same way Jesus dealt with the devil is the same way we, his disciples, are to deal with the devil. Through his word, he brings to you those sinful thoughts. You are supposed to wield the word of God and tell him it is written. It is written. If he brings to you wicked thoughts, tell him it is written. That the mind that is governed by the flesh is dead. But the mind that is governed by the spirit is life and peace. Romans chapter 8 verse 6. And when you do that, you continue applying God's word. That relates to the area of temptation that Satan is bringing into your mind. You will slay him by God's word. For Satan is a liar and he cannot stand the word of God. For the word of God is truth. And Satan is a liar. That is the word of God is what we use to slay Satan. It is the sword of the spirit. So here, we see that Satan continues ensnaring both the saved and the unsaved. But the saved, we have an upper hand over him because we know his schemes, because we've been given what his schemes are in the word of God which is what John is telling us, that it's the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is the snare that we need to beware of. So that whenever Satan brings to us thoughts that are sinful, thoughts that are contrary to the word of God, then we are supposed to be, to be aware, we are supposed to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reminds us the word of God that pertains to the area that Satan is trying to use to tempt us so that we may be able to apply God's word to that area that Satan is trying to tempt us in. 
And that is why every area, every area sorry, of our life must be aligned to the word of God. Whichever area that Satan may try to use, let him find that that area of your life is aligned to the word of God. Because if the area that Satan is trying to use, because Satan uses the open door in your life, he will use what entertains you. If it's movie programs, whatever it is that you like watching, and the values that are being propagated therein are contrary to the word of God, that is the line that Satan will use because he knows what can entertain you, you can accept it. And that is the area that Satan will use. So you need to be careful. What are you feeding your minds on? Because if it is something that is contrary to the word of God, it's something sinful. Sin is anything that is contrary to the word of God. And if that is what you are feeding your mind on, that is the door you have already opened for Satan to come in. He will tempt you not in what you have never thought about. He will always tempt you in what you have thought about. So be careful. Above all else, guard your heart. What is in your mind? What is in your heart? What are you taking in? So meditate on God's word. Let what is coming into you be God's word. So that God's word is what will be in you. So that always you are meditating on God's word. And Satan will have no room, no space, no open door in your life. So every area, let every area of your life be aligned to the word of God. And that way you will be able to defeat Satan. Apostle Paul gave a similar caution in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for you. So he's telling us not to be conformed to the value system of the unsaved world, the unsaved people. Because their value system, what they value, as John has told us, is the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life, which is out of the influence from the devil, who is the prince of this world. And we've been given power over him. Jesus has told us in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, that he beheld Satan fall down, fall down like lightning. Then he told us in verse 19 that, Behold, I give you the power. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy, and nothing whatsoever shall harm you. So for the born-again Christian, we have the power over the devil. We have the power Jesus has given to us to bind him. And he will not have that upper hand on us because we have the authority over him. And he knows we have the authority over him. But he roams like a lion looking for someone that he may devour. The person who, do, who does not know, that born again Christian, who does not know that he has been empowered over the devil. Who does not know that the word of God in the Bible is the sword of the spirit upon which we use to slay Satan. So Satan tempts you, but you are un unarmed. Because you don't have the word of God in you. So you need to have the word of God in you so that you may use it in the same way Jesus used God's word in the wilderness when Satan followed him to tempt him. In the same way, God has good, pleasing, and perfect plan for you if you live by his word. Satan has a deadly plan for you if you fall into his temptation to disobey God's word. Satan's snare, as Apostle John has revealed, is the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. So in application, this is what John tells us, that the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So in application, 
the sinful value system of this world is passing away. Those who let the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life govern their minds will perish because they will die of that snare. Because that snare is there, put by Satan to achieve his end. And his mission is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God's mission is to save you and I, so that we may live forever with him. That even after we have departed from this body, our spirit and our soul will live for eternity with God. That is the plan of God for each and every one of us. So, therefore, God has good plans for us. But those who live by the word of God, who allow the word of God to govern their minds, shall live forever. Living forever means that they shall walk with God in this life and live with him in eternity. That is what living forever is. Walking with God in this life and living with him for eternity in heaven after we, after we have departed from this life. For when a person dies, it's the body that dies. But the spirit that has been created in the image of God does not die. And it goes somewhere. And there is only two places. The spirit and the soul of a person goes. The soul is the mind, will, and emotions. But the spirit is that inner man in us that is created in the image of God. It is a spirit and that spirit does not die. God has designed two places for the spirit of man to go. And that is heaven for those who will believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of their lives and Savior, so that they are reconciled back to God. And their sins, the Adamic sin we are all born with, is taken away by the blood of Jesus. So therefore we become born again to God. And our spirit, when we die, our spirit and soul will go to heaven, the place that he has designed for himself and for those who will turn to him by faith in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus has said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the truth, the way, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And then the word of God tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 12, that this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son, Whoever has the Son of God has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if a person dies and they have not believed and received Jesus, they don't have eternal life. For that eternal life is in Jesus. And when they die, their spirit and soul go to hell, the place for Satan and demons. That is the other fallen angels who supported Satan in his rebellion against God. And they were condemned. They were judged. So therefore, man is not judged. But if they die before they believe and receive Jesus, they have already judged themselves. Because then they die with their sins and atoned for. And then they wake up into judgment. As the word of God tells us, in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27, that it is given for a man to die once, and after that, judgment. And that judgment is on account of Jesus. When this message came to you, that Jesus died to shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sins, the Adamic sin that each and every human being is born with, what action did you take? Did you respond to the message of the gospel? Or did you turn it down? That is what will judge you. That is what will justify you or condemn you. So this message, as this message comes to you, as it has, the honors is upon you to respond to this message of the gospel. Let your mind be governed by the word of God in every situation, in every area of your life, and you shall live forever in victory in Christ. But you will not be able to have this victory if you have not believed and received Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. On your own, you cannot be able to overcome Satan 
because Satan is a fallen angel. An angel is higher than a human being. We are lower. We are in a position lower than angels. So therefore, you can neither wish Satan away, nor can you overcome him. But the moment you believe and receive Jesus, as he has told us in his word, in John chapter 1 verse 12, that to those who believed him, those who received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. So as a child of God, you've been empowered. You have the power of a Satan. And therefore, you will be able to bind him. You will be able to use the word of God to slay him in Jesus' name. For Jesus has given you the power. He has given you the authority. Remember the sons of Sceva who tried to bind a demon and they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus? That demon responded and told them that Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? And that demon which was in that person fought them. There were seven sons of Sceva and they were fought by one person who was demon possessed. They left that place naked. Why? They didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. So therefore they didn't have the power to bind the demon. But because they saw how Apostle Paul went about binding and casting out demons, so they are also attempted to cast out demons using the name of Jesus who Paul preaches. They didn't have a personal relationship with him. So therefore you cannot be able to deal with Satan until you believe and receive Jesus as the Lord of your life and personal Savior. Then you begin to live in accordance to the word of God, knowing that there is a snare which Satan has put in place for both born-again Christians and the unsaved people. And that snare is what John has given to us here. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life, so that you may know that you need to live by the word of God to avoid the snare of the devil. So at this moment, I'll give you a chance to believe and receive Jesus so that you are born again to God, so that now you become reconciled back to God, so that you, you have a right standing before God, so that you become a child of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. For your sins has to be taken away for you to be justified before God once more, for you to be born again to God, as you would have been had Adam and Eve not disobeyed God in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. So therefore, this is the opportunity for you to receive Jesus. So I'm going to lead you in this prayer. You repeat after me, and Jesus will come into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner, and you died for me on the cross. This day, I open the door of my heart. I welcome you to come in, forgive my sins, and be the Lord of my life and personal Savior, and write my name in the book of life. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. If you have made that prayer, you are now born again. You need to invest in a Bible, and you need to start reading your Bible from the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John reveals to you who Jesus is. And as you continue reading chapter after chapter, book after book, you will understand who Christ is. You will understand what salvation is. By the time you reach the last book of the New Testament, that is the book of Revelation, you will have understood who Christ is and what salvation is. So by the time now you go to the book of Genesis, you will be able to see picture of Jesus in every chapter in the Old Testament so that you will not be tied up by the do's and don'ts of the law which points at Jesus because you will know that this has already been accomplished in Christ Jesus and you will be able to grow because the plan of God is that you grow in the image of Christ as he has told us in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 that we beholding the glory of the Lord we are being transformed into his image from glory to glory so as you read the Old Testament you are expected to have a picture of Jesus so that as you read it you will see that the Old Testament points at the coming Messiah so that you will be able to continue growing in Jesus and as you continue growing in him you will discover the gift that he has put in you so that you may begin to use that gift 
to serve him. For no one is idle. Every born again Christian has been given a gift and God expects that you may fan that gift into flame and begin to use it to worship and serve God with it. So, my brothers and sisters, thank you for listening to this message of God. May that word of God which is living and active bear fruit in you until we meet again. And if you have received Jesus today, you need also to belong to a church. You need to look for a Bible-believing church so that you may be able to have fellowship with other believers like you and be able to grow. And that way you'll be able to stand in faith and be able to stay away from the snare of the devil, which is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. May the Lord bless you until we meet again. Amen.